Welcome to Zoo Tours, the channel that brings the zoo right to you. If this is your first tour, hit those like and subscribe buttons and that bell icon to officially join the zoo crew. Whether you're a big zoo fanatic like me or you go to zoos every so often, you know that big names like Henry Dorley, San Diego, and Columbus are always making headlines. And honestly, you can't blame them. But you know, sometimes it's nice to take away their spotlight and give it to the little guys. When I think of zoos that need a little more attention, I think of Indiana's Fort Wayne Children's Zoo, which I believe, for lack of a better word, is underrated. Today, I'll try to convince you with their African journey. This adventure welcomed visitors to walk about the Serengeti in 2009. This sort of gives off the vibe that you're seeing yet another typical African savanna, filled with a bunch of wildlife that can be found at just about any other zoo. Well, it's a little more than that. First of all, it's not little. From entrance to exit, the trail is half a mile through three sections, covering 15 of the zoo's 38 acres. That's Indiana's largest zoo attraction. If I had to describe this in one word, it would be diverse. From birds, large, medium, and small, to a wide variety of carnivores and colorful primates. Found in the continent's wetlands, savannas, forests, and the mountainous regions of Eastern Asia, you will easily see that this is not your average Africa excursion. The very first feature isn't a wild animal, but a waterfall. Just one of several that I hope you'll notice along the trail. And to complement this peaceful display, the entrance path is blanketed in a cloud of mist. And it really helps you cool off on a hot summer day. And it creates a sense of immersion as if you're actually out in the wild. At the same time, the mist fades. The archway to the safari trail is in view. Now, like I said, this exhibit shows you the wide variety of Africa's environments. And coming from the wetlands is the Sitatanga. Every animal on the planet has at least one standout characteristic. And for these guys, their speciality is in their hooves. I know we've talked about it before, but I've noticed that we have quite a few new faces on this tour. But before we get into that, this antelope loves the swamp and they don't mind taking a dip to cool off, to get rid of any pesky flies, or even to escape an oncoming predator, just as long as there's plenty of vegetation to eat and to help them hide from a hungry crocodile. But if they're feeling extra cautious, that's when they turn to their feet. Sitatungas have long banana-shaped hooves. While it does make them a little clumsy on land, it also helps them walk through the water, so much so they can move almost silently and therefore remain undetected from nearby predators. Now I hate to backtrack, but right before the Sitatungas, I just have to mention the Sky Safari, a ski lift that takes you 38 feet off the ground to give riders a 2,000 foot long aerial view of this beautiful Serengeti landscape. I've never taken a ride, so I've never filmed it, but you can still sort of experience the Sky Safari in some way with the links in the description. Alright, we're back on the safari trail, and our second stop is one of the best ways to see the visual definition of monkey business. Thanks to spot-nosed monkeys. Their scientific name, Cercopithecus heterista, essentially translates to acrobatic monkey, referring to their leaping abilities. But they're not the only ones who join in on this mischief. This monkey business is a partnership with Allen Swamp Monkeys. This extremely social primate is arboreal, you know, like almost every primate, but they spend a lot of time on the ground foraging for food in the lowland forests and rivers of the Congo Basin. If it involves food or, again, to flee an oncoming predator, they have no problem diving right into the water. This behavior is not entirely common for a primate, but like the Sitatunga, swamp monkeys are prepared for an aquatic lifestyle. They may not be as well adapted as, let's say, a duck, but this monkey's toes are slightly webbed, which helps them paddle and makes them expert swimmers. If you're actually here at this point, remember to take a left. Now every zoo photographer has to deal with at least one animal per visit that never stays still long enough for a good shot. For me, that's always the zoo's red-billed hornbill. 
And if you can't get a good photo of them, you can always get a family photo shoot at the nearby abandoned Land Rover. Coming up is one of the most immersive displays you'll ever come across. The beautiful landscape can be an attraction by itself, and you'll have no trouble getting really close to the great white pelicans. When the sun peeks over the horizon, that means it's time to go fishing. Unlike the brown pelican, they don't nosedive into the water from the air. It's more of a team effort on the surface. When great white pelicans are on the hunt, the group will form a U-shape to chase fish into shallow regions at the end of a lake. Once they're trapped, the birds will scoop their prey up, tilt their heads back, and swallow them whole. But they gotta be quick. Since they work together, if a pelican keeps their mouth open for too long, another might take the risk and steal the fish right out of their friend's mouth. This is where the African journey starts to change things up. The path brings you out of the open wetlands and into the savanna rocks, also called the kapi, where many species gather for food and protection, which is why the zoo calls them the rocks of refuge. And our very first refugee is the white stork, who is not limited to just Africa, but they also migrate to eastern parts of Europe, the Middle East, and India. Here in Indiana, they live in sort of a predator and prey setup. Although in the wild, they would worry more about power lines than they would a bat-eared fox. Not like most wild dogs and wolves, this little nine pound fox never goes after anything large and rarely eats other mammals. They prefer invertebrates, lizards, fruit, and bird eggs. So their prey may be very small too, but they have excellent hearing as an advantage. Smaller creatures are not the only ones you'll find on a copy. Sometimes large mammals will use them to scope out their prey. Predators, like the spotted hyena. They have a reputation as scavengers, and while that may be true, a large group is capable of taking down hoofstock much larger than themselves. They are not only successful hunters, but successful eaters. To go along with their bone-cracking jaws, hyenas have special stomach acids to break down animal parts that many other species cannot digest. One group can consist of 80 members that live in a matriarchal society, but males and females are often mistaken for one another for two reasons. The girls can be 10% larger than the boys, and I'd share the other reason, but I'm willing to bet there's also younger viewers on this tour group, so we'll be moving on. The next cave brings you face to face with the hyena's mortal enemy, the African lion. The two have a conflict that goes back thousands and thousands of years, and it's all because their diets overlap and neither is willing to share. Hyenas may have the scavenger title and have larger groups, but with their intimidating size and determination, these big cats are most likely to steal a meal from the hyenas. Male Bahati and female Ina and their cackling rivals obviously don't have to deal with this, and like their neighbors, they have a fantastic exhibit, the greatest and largest of its kind I've seen so far. And this isn't the only view. But first, the next set of enclosures are settled up against something much larger we'll see later. So those animals can always be watched by a serval, a cat with a wait and see hunting strategy. Instead of chasing down their prey, they usually wait patiently in the grass for a bird to fly over and they'll leap several feet in the air and bring their victims down with them. On my second visit to Fort Wayne, I noticed the honey badger was replaced by vulturine guinea fowl, and I'd love to talk about them, but this was two years ago. This exhibit is featherless and is now quillful with cape porcupines. Just about every copy exhibit has meerkats. Well, you're about to meet, I guess you could say, their alternative, the banded mongoose. Everyone knows the unbreakable friendship between Timon and Pumbaa, the famous duo of the meerkat and the warthog. But what a lot of people don't know is, warthogs are more so banded brothers with this nomadic mongoose. And like a clownfish to an anemone, they have a symbiotic relationship. If the wild pigs are fed up with invasive ticks and other bugs crawling all over, 
They have a quick and easy solution. Warthogs have been witnessed seeking out and lying down in the presence of banded mongooses, and like a cleaning crew, they'll inspect and even climb on their customers to gain access to the parasites. So in return for their grooming services, the mongoose receives a meal. And speaking of Disney characters, just past them is your last chance to get up close with the lions, revealing just how big their enclosure really is. The rock walls may be coming to an end, but there's still just one more stop outside of the copy, the radiated tortoise. The funny thing is they're endemic to Madagascar and prefer dry and thorn forests of the southern parts of the island, so you would not find them hanging out on a giant African savanna rock. So we've covered wetlands, copies, and now the safari trail becomes the African village which focuses more on the rainforest. And the first ones to greet you on this new trail is a pair of silvery-cheeked hornbills. All 62 species of hornbills, whether big or small, are characterized by their cask and long beaks. It looks heavy, but since they're made out of a honeycomb-like structure on the inside and a thin layer of keratin, they're actually lightweight and easily maneuverable. And speaking of not going along with the theme, it only took four visits, but I finally saw the leopard. And sorry to break it to you, but it's not an African subspecies, but Wyatt is an Amor leopard. You can find this cat in freezing temperatures along the eastern border of China and Russia. But if you were to actually go out looking for one, good luck. They're not just shy and cautious, there's not enough of them to be seen too often. Amores may be doing well in zoos, but roughly 100 exist in the wild. So to answer your question, why are they here? African leopards are about as hard to come by in the US as it is to see a wild Amor leopard. And even if you do find one in the States, chances are they're not even genetically pure. Regardless of how rare they are over here, the other reason is African leopards are not endangered, while Amors are still in serious need of a population increase. And if a zoo is going to have a leopard, the AZA is encouraging them to focus on keeping and breeding the ones from Russia. So it's becoming incredibly common to use them in place of the African subspecies and simply refer to them as a leopard. However, even though they're not pure, we will still see the channel's first African leopards pretty soon. You'll most likely see him sleeping, but it's never nap time for the Debraza's monkeys. They may have an Italian name, but they are settled in the lowland forests of Central Africa. They're not endangered or listed as threatened, but this colorful primate is very cryptic in nature, so it's hard for researchers to document their numbers. They're just that good at hiding. When they feel threatened, the monkey will curl up into a ball so that only their backs are visible, and they're able to freeze and remain in this position for hours until they feel they're safe. The Debraza's monkey is social amongst themselves, but is very hostile towards other primates, with one exception, the black and white colobus. This generous behavior might be due to the fact that colobus monkeys have different digestive tracts and therefore a different diet, which allows these two to share the same territory without any competition. The Debrazas primarily go for fruit, and the colobus mostly eats leaves. Next, at this village, in a similar enclosure, the African Grey Parrot. They're very intelligent and very popular as pets, and are regularly kept by us as a companion animal. And as a bonus, they're prized for its ability to mimic human speech. So yes, they can be a bit noisy, but easy to spot no matter what zoo you're at that displays them. What I can never seem to find is the buff crested bustard that allegedly lives below the parrots. The safari trail continues, but first, you cannot miss the Vero's Eagle Owl. People are used to hearing this bird of prey hunt for smaller targets like mice or small birds, but Africa's largest owl is never exactly on a diet, and they go after hyraxes genets, warthog piglets, and even medium-sized monkeys. Now the safari trail continues, and I have never seen people get so excited for reticulated giraffes. There's one big and one simple reason why so many zoos love to have them, 
They're crowd pleasers. I've seen visitors rush to see giraffes, but not like this. You'd think that there was a concert about to start, and it's this crowded because, well yeah, giraffes are very popular, but this mob is here for the giraffe feeding, which is nothing new. But they do things a little different here in Fort Wayne. This platform is a 14 foot tall deck shaped like a square and the giraffes can come right to the railing from three different sides whenever they please. So instead of having to wait in a long line, it's basically a feeding free for all. You know I talk about how no one does giraffe feeding better than bush gardens. Honestly, this can be just as fun and I'd much rather pay a dollar than $40. Let's say you don't feel like paying for a piece of lettuce. That's no problem. Even if you come empty handed, you can still get as close as possible. Just remember though that this is not a petting zoo. And by the way, no, this is not the only way the giraffes can get their food. If they don't feel like being hand fed and dealing with the screaming, there are several feeding posts scattered around the largest and greatest standalone giraffe exhibit I have ever seen, which is something you don't see very often. This is where the boardwalk starts to take you back towards the exit, and there's no chance that you won't stop and admire the plains. The path is built around this entire field, from the Sitatungas to the Pelicans to the exit, but literally is the centerpiece to the African journey. This open pasture is over three and a half acres, which makes it not only the zoo's biggest enclosure by far, but based on my measurements, it should be the largest zoo exhibit in the entire state of Indiana. Usually large savannas are filled with a great number of hoofstock and birds. Fort Wayne's has four species. It may not be a lot compared to how some other zoos pack their savannas, but hey, who are we to say that they should have less space? This is about as close as you're going to get, but that wasn't always the case. From 1976 to 2006, an enclosed safari truck could take you right through the veldt for an up-close encounter. The big three that stand out are the ostriches, plain zebras, and blue wildebeests. The zebras and wildebeests also have a symbiotic relationship, basically meaning they have each other's backs. Zebras love the tall grass. Their friends like the shortcut grass, so there's no competition when it comes to food. They also act as each other's alarms. Wildebeests have a good sense of hearing, while the equines have a good sense of smell. So keeping each other around helps both protect themselves against predators. There are several different spots where you can see all this. My favorite is the Zebra Research Station, an educational shelter that's far overlooked. There's decorative and interactive displays that shows how a zebra behaves, why zebras and wildebeests make a good team, and why African hoofstock have massive migrations. The herd here does a pretty good job staying away from us, so if you don't have a zoom camera, you can still use the tower viewer from this station. And yes, it does look better than this. From personal experience, you'll most likely never see all four savanna species together because the Rupel's griffin vultures like to do their own thing by the watering hole. Tucked between the plains and the boardwalk, there used to be a dense forest for black storks. Now it looks like this. It's a little more manicured and now contains Edgar, a marabou stork. Having such unique physical features usually comes with some pretty unique facts, and this stork has a lot of them. They live in regions that can get kind of toasty, and if you want to know if they're cooled off, just look at their legs. If they're white, it means they defecated on them to beat the heat. I can name quite a few more interesting facts, but I think I'll save them for another tour. On this very same boardwalk, you can say your final goodbyes to the giraffes, which also means you have just one more stop, I promise. Near the exit and the end of the plains are waddled cranes. If you were to ever somehow stand right next to one of these beauties, you'd be squaring up against Africa's tallest crane, and some of you may even come up shorter, as this wetland native's maximum height is nearly 6 feet. And if that day ever comes where both of you go head to head, just try not to stare. They're named after that flap of skin that dangles from their chin, and believe it or not, it does have a purpose. Like our facial expressions do for us, this flap indicates their mood. 
that waddle, will shrink if the crane is afraid or nervous, or elongate if they are thrilled or excited. Once you've finally reached the end, you can either loop back around into the mist for round two, or go back under Sherman Boulevard and expand on your journey at the rest of the zoo. I know this was exhausting, but hopefully it did convince you that this place deserves a little more attention. And we are finally closing out what is one of the channel's longest tours. Find out if the next episode will beat it. It won't, but believe me, it'll be worth a watch. So stay tuned. See if you can answer this week's trivia question. And thank you for watching. <laughs>